How's everybody doing this morning? Man, God is so good, ain't he? Oh, we're so glad that you guys are here with us today. Uh, I see a lot of familiar faces today, and we're so glad you're here with us. We just encourage you guys, uh, you know, to get loose, uh, get open to the presence of God today. Well, let's just pray real quick. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity, God, to be in unity with you, Father God, in your presence, in communion with you, Jesus. Jesus, we're so sorry for forgetting about, God, your sacrifice sometimes and the power of your sacrifice and how good you are to us, Father God. We ask for a revelation, uh, a fresh revelation of your love today, God, even through this worship, Father God. Help us to cultivate, God, this community of worship, God, in this place today, Father God, and be open to what you want to do, God. We thank you so much for your goodness. We thank you for your love, Jesus. We thank you for your blood. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody shout it out. Amen, amen. Let's give him some praise.
Thank you, Lord. Awake us this morning, God. Awake us this morning. Let's lift up our hands and worship the Lord this morning. Oh, let's give Him praise this morning. Father, we surrender this morning, God. Break up that fallow ground this morning in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. Oh, we worship you. We bless you, God, in Jesus' mighty name. Father, we thank you this morning. For this opportunity, God, to be in your house, to worship you, God. Oh, God, in Jesus' mighty name. Oh, let's lift up your hands for a minute here. Thank you, Lord. Stir up the gift that is within you this morning. Break up that fallow ground this morning. Thank you, God. Father, awake these bones, God. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we give you praise, God. Oh, we worship you. You're worthy to be praised. You're worthy to be praised. Oh, thank you, God. Glory to Jesus. Glory to you, Jesus. Can you call the name of Jesus this morning? Oh, wonderful Jesus. You're so wonderful. You're so worthy to be praised, God. You're so worthy to be praised this morning, God. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, strengthen your people this morning, God. Spirit of the living God, just touch us this morning. Lead us and guide us and touch us, God. Let us have an ear to hear, God, what you are speaking this morning, God. In Jesus' mighty name, we give you praise, Jesus. We give you praise, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. He's worthy to be praised. He's worthy to be praised. He's worthy to be praised. Let's give God a hand of applause this morning. It's good to be in the house of God.
are in a series, and we're going to continue our series called Crazy Faith. I've been enjoying this series. I don't know about you. It's been ministering to me. I don't know about you. I hope it has. Uh, our foundation scriptures, Hebrews 11.1, 1, if we could go there. And Hebrews 11.6, uh, faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things that we cannot see. Hebrews 11.6, and it is impossible to please God without what? Faith. Without faith. Let's pray. Lord God, I just thank you for this time with my amazing brothers and sisters. Lord, I ask that you just release your word right now, God, and just as our praises went up this morning, your glory's in this place, and, and Holy Spirit, I ask that you just speak to us. Our hearts are open to receive what you have for us today. We thank you. You're good. You're glorious. We give you all the praise, honor, and glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody shouts, amen. amen. So to be honest, I'm going to be a little transparent with y'all this morning. Um, I was a little stressed. Uh, as a pastor, you know, sometimes we, we have a sermon, like Sunday to Sunday comes by so fast for us. We prepare a message, and Monday it's like, okay, we got to prepare another one. <clears throat> and all week I was just a little stressed, and I was like, God, I am fresh out of ideas. Like, if you have something to say, am I out of faith, God? Like, help me out here. Like, if you have anything to say about faith, please let me know, because Sunday is coming fast. And on Friday, I, I just got in the presence of God, and he just, he really just downloaded some things for me and, and for you. So I'm excited to share that this morning. And of course, we're going to continue our theme of, of examples of great men and women in the Bible of, who had great faith, crazy faith. Uh, my dad mentioned Solomon, who was the son of David, the wisest and richest king to ever live. He wrote portions of the Bible. <clears throat> there's, um, there's a story where he offered such a great sacrifice that God asked him, anything you want, just name it and I'll give it to you. If God told you that, what would you say? What would we say? Some of like, oh, God, a billion dollars sounds pretty good, right? Y'all be like, but then Solomon said, God, give me wisdom so that way I can govern your people the way you want me to. And God was like, since you asked for wisdom and not riches and not fame, you're going to have all of that. If we, if we remember John the Baptist in the Bible who, who proclaimed, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. That wasn't a popular opinion. And he was just proclaiming, repent. He was a voice shouting out in the wilderness, and he paved the way for the coming of Christ. If you remember the story of Stephen, who was actually the first one to die for the name of Jesus. And the Bible says that he was full of the Spirit and full of faith. And even as he was being martyred, they were stoning him. And he said, God, do not charge these people with this sin. Man, he was full of faith. If you remember the woman with the alabaster jar who came before Jesus and, and she broke a bottle of expensive perfume worth a year's wages and poured it on Jesus in surrender. And these men and women that, that we've, we've seen and we, we've talked about, they were not just people of crazy faith. Not only were they all in with God, not only did they stay on assignment, but they also reached a certain level of surrender to God's will. And the title of this message today is Faith to Live Surrendered. Turn to your neighbor and say surrendered. I like what evangelist Rhonda Harrison uh, pounded a couple weeks ago about John, in John 3.30, about that we must decrease and he must increase. Actually, John the Baptist is the one that said that. Man, we must decrease and he must increase in us. Right? We, we read in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In Colossians 3.2, think about the things of heaven, not of earth. For you died to this life, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And these sound great, right? But if we're honest, there's some certain areas where our old self doesn't want to give up. Can we be honest? It doesn't want to release. It doesn't want to surrender. Our old self doesn't want to die too. Can we be, am I the only one? Or is there more of us in here? 
It's like our, our old self goes into survival mode, right? To stay alive. There are so many scriptures about dying to self and dying to, to old things of the past. But man, how is it when, when our, our old self doesn't want to die, right? Our old self doesn't want to give the old way of life, the old habits, the old ways of thinking. Man, how, how can we die to ourself when, when our old self resurrects almost, right? The old self survived yesterday's death and is still alive today. The old self doesn't stay dead. The old self wants what it wants, and it's going to claw and scratch his or her, or her way back into the driver's seat of our life. And I, I felt really the Lord saying, because I was like, God, how do, man, how do we just keep the old self dead? And I felt the Lord say, the key is everyday surrender. Everyday surrender. Tap your neighbor and say, everyday surrender. And when we lift our hands, like when the worships, when we're worshiping and we're singing, man, we lift our hands, right? Do y'all know what lifting our hands, what it represents? It represents surrender, right? That's the universal sign of surrender. It's like, hey, <laughs> like, I give up. Don't shoot, right? And when we come before God and we're here in church, we're like, God, I surrender. And, and going back to the, to the woman with the alabaster jar that I mentioned, let's turn to Mark 14. And we're going to read her story. And, and God, as, as I was on Friday, as God was giving me this, he showed me this story. And as I began to read it, he began to open my, my spiritual eyes to things in this story. Mark 14, are you all there? Verse 3. It says, Meanwhile, Jesus was in Bethany at the home of Simon, a man who had previously had leprosy. He was eating... And a woman came with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume made from essence of nard. She broke open the jar and poured the perfume over his head. Some of those at the table were indignant. Why waste such expensive perfume? They asked. Verse 5. It could have been sold for a year's wages. That's some expensive perfume, right? And the money given to the poor. So they scolded her harshly. Let's go to Luke 7, verse 38. So it's the same story, but different accounts. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them with her hair. She kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. And, and I want to give y'all, there's three, three areas of what she did. And I, I want to I give y'all three things, three areas of surrender that I believe that God is speaking to us today that we need to surrender to him. Amen. Number one is the alabaster jar. And this represented her life, who she had been. This could represent your life and who you've been up to this point, whether good or bad. This represents your achievements, your failures, your status, your degrees, accomplishments. Maybe you didn't accomplish what you wanted to. Maybe you didn't finish high school or finish, finish college and the, the enemy's lying to you saying you're a failure. Maybe you thought that your life would look different by this age or different in this stage of your life. Maybe you tried, tried some things that they, they didn't work out and you see yourself as a failure. Maybe the devil's lied to you and made you believe that you are a failure and you're always, you'll always will be because your marriage didn't work or because, you know, your children, y'all don't have the best relationship or you're struggling financially. Maybe or maybe your life has been good. Maybe your marriage is wonderful. And congratulations. Maybe your family's doing well and your, your business is doing well and you love your job. Either way, God wants us to surrender our life and who we've been up to this point. Our dreams, our goals, our future, what we think our life should have looked like, our failures, our successes, our wins, our lack of success, whatever the case may be, he wants us to surrender it. When the woman came and broke the, the, the alabaster jar, 
it was worth a year's wages. This represented her, her financial status. And I, I had this thought, what did she have to do to get the money to buy that perfume? Man, it represented her occupation. The Pharisees looked, the, looked down on her. If only he knew what kind of woman she was. It represented her reputation. Maybe she had a bad reputation because of her occupation, right? Maybe it was demeaning occupation. Maybe she was like, this is not how I envisioned my life to be. This is not who I wanted to be. I didn't think my life would end up this way. And when she broke open this jar on the head of Jesus, it was like, this is my life and I surrender it to you. And the Pharisees, what did they say? What a waste. What a waste. But this is her pouring out her life onto Jesus in surrender. Amen? Amen. And when we live our lives for Jesus, some may say, what a waste. Or you may, you may think, am I wasting my time? Am I wasting my time coming to church? Am I wasting my time trying to pursue the things of God? Maybe you have thought that. I know a lot of people think, man, if, let, me, let me live my life how I want, and someday I'll give my life to Jesus. I remember when I was younger, it was when I was younger, don't, don't judge me, all right? I remember I used to think, when I die, which I hope I die at an old age, I hope I die a s slow. That way with my last breath, I can be like, Jesus, forgive me. <sighs> and then like go. Like live my life however I wanted. And then with my last breath, be like, Jesus, I surrender. <sighs> and barely make it to heaven. All right, don't judge me. That's how you say I feel the judgment. Don't judge me. But here this woman was anointing he said she don't judge her she's anointing she's preparing my body for burial she's anointing me preparing me she's anointing my body man what a privilege it was for her to pour out everything that represented onto jesus in preparation for what he was about to do to anoint the son of god for an event that would change the history of mankind right this story is actually recorded in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And Jesus said that wherever the gospel is preached, wherever the good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deeds will be remembered. Man, what a privilege it was for her to do that. Everybody is saying, no, no, what a waste. What a waste. No, what a privilege. And, and may, maybe some people have told you, what a waste. Or you thought, what a waste. Is, is it a waste to live for God? No, it's a privilege right? Whatever we do for God is a privilege. Amen? For example, I like to use my dad's example, and we were actually talking during the week, and I was kind of asking him questions about, about his conversion. Before he, he became, he, before he accepted Christ, like he was a business owner, he was, he had wealth, material things, he was a baller, some would say a shot caller, like he had it all. And when he decided to give it all up for God, some people were saying, what a waste. Like some people even, they were saying, he's lost his mind. Like they literally thought like he went crazy. Like, man, he did too much of his drugs and he's gone insane. And he's, turned, he's wasting all that he has for I don't know. And I know that... Um, when he, he gave his life to God and he, he had nightclubs and he decided to close them with some other pastors while they were open. So like, could you imagine like dancing and getting, your, like, getting it on and then like they come turn on the lights and hey, we're shutting down. The, the owner became a Christian. And he said that even people were like, oh, I repent. Like there was Christians in the club and they're like, oh, I repent. Right there and then. But they started burning the alcohol. And people were like, oh my gosh, what a waste. Like, give it to me. Don't burn it. Like, give the alcohol to me. But what he was doing was he was breaking the alabaster jar of his life and surrendered it to God. And it's funny, he was telling me uh, this week that uh, 
he had to he he gave up his occupation, so he had to do something, and he ended up being a a news throwing newspapers and driving a school bus. Like, could you imagine going from like businessman to like okay driving two hundred screaming or how many however many kids in a school like screaming kids in a school bus, and I could imagine the devil like did you did you make the right decision to give all that up to be where you are now? And if you ask my dad, he's like. A hundred percent. Like, I wouldn't change it. I wouldn't a hundred times out of a hundred times, I would make the same decision. When we do anything for God, when we give our life, when we pour out our life and surrender to God, it's never wasted. Amen. Amen. And even earlier in my life, I had my own ideas of what I wanted my life to look like. Like, I had plans for my own life, vision for my own life. I wanted nothing to do with pastoring at one point. Like, I, I was like, my dad's a pastor. I know I'm probably going to have to be a pastor, but I see how, you know, people are crazy. Like, I want nothing to do with crazy people, having to minister to crazy people with all these issues, all these problems. I want none of that. But I'm glad, I'm so glad that God just really turned my heart and changed, changed my heart to, to what he wanted for my life. Um, and and I, as I get older, I realize that a surrendered life it's not a one-time decision. Like, it's not like I give my, I'm, my life to you today, Lord, and like, that's it. I'm good. Not, no, but it's an everyday decision. It's an everyday choice. Because that old guy that you left behind is going to want to come back, right? Those old habits are going to want to crawl back in and creep into our life. But it's going to be an everyday decision, an everyday surrender. I like uh, the account in John 12 of this same story. It says that the house, when she broke open the jar of her life, the house was filled with the fragrance. When she broke open that jar and poured it on Jesus to anoint him, the house was filled with the fragrance, the beautiful smell of that expensive perfume. And in 2 Corinthians 2.15, it says, Our lives are a Christ-like fragrance. Rising up to God. Can y'all just see the parallels there? Our surrender, when we, when we come before God each and every day and we say, God, I surrender my life. All that I am, God. All that I've been. I, I give it to you. I give you control. I believe it's just a sweet smelling fragrance that just rises up to God. Amen? So, so what does it look like? What is the practicality of surrender every day? What, what does it look like if if I'm going to tell you, I want you to practice this on Monday, give you something to practice on Monday, all right? Some of you are like, surrender my occupation? That means I quit my job tomorrow? I can do that. I don't like it. I'll do that. No, that's not what I'm saying, all right? Surrender my wife and kids? Like, I'll do that. Like, I had my kids at home since March. Like, I'm ready to, like, drop them off somewhere and surrender. No, that's not what I'm saying, all right? But just letting God be in control. Every decision... Every major decision, just coming before the presence of God and saying, God, like, help me. Right. Speak to me. Amen. Help me make the every even every small decision. God, I surrender my will to you. Yes. Amen? And just letting God be in control of the major parts of our life and just coming and permeating every area of our life so that we can be surrendered in every area of our life. Amen? Amen. Number two. Her tears, the Bible says that she came and she wept on her feet, on, on Jesus' feet. And I believe her tears represented her emotions. I believe those tears were coming from the depths of her soul. She was surrendering every hurt, every emotional trauma, even probably just hearing those men talk about her. If only Jesus knew what kind of woman she was. Man, that probably even just hit her right in the heart. That probably hurt. People, people probably talking about her all over town. She probably was rejected by everybody and everyone. And we talk about the importance of, of inner healing a lot. And I believe that surrendering our emotions, our hurts, our pains, our heartbreaks, those times of rejection is essential to being crucified with Christ. And this is a big area of our, of our life that, 
that can either make us or break us, the area of our emotions. And I'm going to be honest, sometimes even as a man, my emotions are all over the place. I can't imagine y'all women. No, I'm just joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. I know women are more emotional. And as a man, like, my emotions can be, like, up and down and, and you know, okay one day and just the next day. And, and, man, but I know that I can't let my emotions guide my life or my decisions. I have to surrender them to God every day. Surrendering our emotions, our, our hurts, our rejections, any unforgiveness that we have, it's, it's so necessary to keep that old man from coming back into control of our life. Let's go. I want to read you a couple of scriptures that will probably help you. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens. Man, that, there can be some heavy burdens in our, in our emotions, right? Like just the way we get a cut and we have to bandage and we have to like put, you know, so it won't get infected. Man, sometimes we have some cuts inside that never get bandaged or never get disinfected, right? And we carry that. It's a heavy burden. But Jesus says, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Psalm 147.3, he heals the brokenhearted and bandages their wounds. Psalm 34.18 the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. And Jeremiah 18, 14 says, O oh Lord, you heal me. If you heal me, I will truly be healed. If you save me, I will truly be saved. My praises are for you alone. Aren't those good? So, so what does it look like? What does it look like to surrender your emotions, surrender your hurt, surrender? It, it just, it's just us coming before God and being real with ourselves. Like a lot of times we mask our inner pain and just coming before God and being real before God because he knows. And just say, God, I'm, I'm hurting. God, I've, I've been hurt. God, I've been through some emotional trauma in my life. Lord, will you heal me? Lord, will you bandage my broken heart. And also, this is a big one. Lord, I forgive those that have hurt me. Man, that's hard, right? What about this? Lord, bless those who have hurt me. Oh, shoot. Y'all are like, nah, nah, I don't know about that. Like, I'll forgive them, but Lord, do not bless them. Do not bless sister so-and-so. You don't know she did some crazy stuff. No. Like, can we say, Lord, bless them. And Jesus, if we just look at Jesus, the ultimate example of someone who lived their life completely surrendered to the will of God. Can you imagine when he was about to be crucified? And, of course, he didn't want to go to the cross. He was like, God, if, 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 there's, the, if there's any way that I can get out of this, but he said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. But could you imagine what he was going through his mind? I'm going to give my life for the same men who are about to come and take me away. Like, I'm going to give my life for the same man who's going to punch me in the face. I'm going to give my life for the same people who are going to spit in my face. For the same people who are going to pull out my beard and lash me in the back and hit my head with the stick. How many of you would say that? Or you'd be like, man, those people could go to you know where. Literally, because if I don't die for them, that's where they're going to go. Like, no, but Jesus is like, God, not my will, but your will be done. Like, talk about surrender. Man. And he even, even on the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. If Jesus was able to forgive those people who were in the act of crucifying him, shouldn't we be able to forgive the people who have hurt us in the past or, or rejected us or came against us or whatever the case may be, 
I don't know, but you know. But talk about emotional surrender on Jesus' part. Father, forgive them. Like, I'm going to lay down my life for these same people who are going to just, man, come against me like nobody, nobody ever has before. And I think just that surrender, that emotional surrender every day, no matter how we feel, I, I have this planner that I write out every day, and it has questions, and there's one that says, a message to yourself. And I, I've been writing, um, I must decrease and he must increase. And that's been on my heart every, every day. And that's how, man, God, I just surrender my life, who I've been, my emotions, how I feel today. Even though I don't feel good, God, I surrender it to you today. Amen? And number three, her hair. She came, she broke open the, the, the alabaster jar which represents her life. She surrendered it to Jesus. She anoints him for, for she probably doesn't know the, the privilege that, that she was just in, she was just surrendering. And I, I believe that's how, how we are. When we surrender, we don't know the impact, the eternal impact that we have when we live a surrendered life, right? She probably didn't know. She was just in complete humility and surrendering to Jesus. And she was preparing his body for, for what was to come. She comes and she breaks the alabaster jar of her life. She, she kneels down. She begins to weep, begins to, to pour out her emotions, her trauma, her hurt, everything, her rejection. She begins to just let it come out all on his feet. And it says she, she grabs her hair and she begins to wipe her, his feet with her hair. And I believe her hair represented her identity. The third area of our life that I know that God wants us to, to surrender to him is our identity. How we see ourselves and how we think others see us. Who we believe we are. Even our physical bodies. Our insecurities. Or maybe vanities, right? And obviously she had, she had long hair. And she probably used that, that hair before, before she came and used it on Jesus' feet. She probably used her long hair promiscuously. Maybe her looks promiscuously. Maybe every, everybody knew her as an as a immoral woman. And she saw herself as an immoral woman. And she took on that identity. And when she came and she wiped his feet with her hair, I believe she was saying, God, I give you my identity. And we don't find our identity in our looks, Right? Some of you are good looking, I know, all right? We all know you don't find your identity in your looks, in your occupation, in your financial status, or what people say about you. Sometimes we put so much weight on what, what people think about us, and that's not where we find our identity. We find our identity in Christ, right? And many, many times we have insecurities about our bodies, or, or maybe just not our bodies, but where we are in life. And we see ourselves in a negative way. Man, I'm not married yet. Man, I'm not in a relationship yet. What's wrong with me? Man, we just got to surrender all that to Jesus, right? Just give it all to him. Anyone ever have something that they didn't like about themselves growing up? For me, it was the Andrade ears. All right, I, through, through genetics, it was past my grandpa, Simone, amazing man of God. He passed him down to my dad. And my dad passed him down to me. And I remember being young, and I would look in the mirror, and I would be like, man, I cannot wait to grow up and be rich. So I can get some plastic surgery on these things. Man, I cannot wait. And I'm glad that I, I'm, my head got a little bigger. Um, I grew into the Andrade ears a, a, a little bit. They're, they're, they're still prominent, not as prominent as they used to be. But man, how can, man, sometimes us as people, we just go through extreme lengths 
because we don't like how God made us, right? And just even just surrendering all that to, to God, surrendering it at, at the foot of Jesus, all our insecurities, the negative ways we see ourselves, surrendering how we see ourselves and taking up our true identity, which is in Jesus. And, and I think finding who, who God called us to be and who we really are is just exchanging how we see ourselves for how God sees us. So in this story, we have three perspectives. Her perspective, which was probably not very good. She, she, was, she came broken. She came humble. She probably knew who she was and who she had been. Man, I'm just, everybody says I'm an immoral woman. That, that's how I've been. And she came humbled and broken. The other's perspective, who saw her as, man, if, if he only knew who she was, he, he wouldn't even let her touch him. Well, she's, a, she's an immoral woman in the perspective of Jesus. And look at the drastic difference between our perspectives. Jesus said, wherever the good news is preached, this woman's deeds and who she is and what she's doing for, for me now will be discussed and remembered. Can y'all see the difference in perspectives? Right? Man, what she's doing now, who she is, she's coming broken. She's coming surrendered. And because of that, wherever the good news is preached, people are going to talk about her. Hey, we're talking about her today, right? So what is the practicality of, of surrendering our identity? The area of who, who we see ourselves as and, and what we think other people see ourselves as. And maybe it's negative. I don't know. Maybe it's positive. But David... In Psalm 139, 14, it says, Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. When, when you see something that you don't like about yourself, be like, thank you, God, for making me so wonderfully complex. It's the complexity of which you made me that made me this way, Right? If you see something that you don't like about yourself, like me, I'm like, God, how marvelous is your workmanship on these Andrade ears? How well I know it. Like just the curves. Maybe you're like, oh, I could lose a few pounds. But how marvelous is your workmanship, right? And David was confident. I believe he was so confident. How well I know it. Because he saw himself through the eyes of God. And I believe when we pray, we just got to say, God, let me see myself the way you see me. Like, Jesus, I know I've been this way. I know the old man has come back in this area of my life. But Jesus, let me see you through, through your eyes and who I am and who I'm called to be. Amen. And Jesus is still even dealing with me in this area of identity. Like, I haven't made it nowhere. I haven't, man, I haven't achieved nothing. And God is still working in me and, and progressing in me. And even this past week, um, I went to the doctor because I, I had an injury working out. And um, when the injury happened, I, I thought, oh, man, this could be serious. Like, I, I'm not going to work out till, till I go to the doctor and make sure this is not serious. And of course, like that old, oh God, why did you let this happen to me? You know, how we all get. And I felt God say, almost like you're spending a lot of time working out. Like, are you working out because you want to be healthy and your body and you do everything I'm calling you to do? Or are you doing it because there's some insecurities in your life that I haven't yet touched? And so God showed me, like, man, our bodies will fade, right? Our bodies, like, Jesus, come by, back tonight, and I'll get a new body. So I, I haven't achieved nothing. I haven't. God is still working in all of us, right? And I love what Paul says in Philippians 3.12. I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection, but I press on to possess 
that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. And like I said, I don't stand here as a pastor acting like I have achieved all this. Man, God is showing me this to help me out also, right? And it's just that level, and, and, and we read about the people in the Bible. They, they were just at an, another level of surrender, another level of, God, here's my life. Here's the alabaster jar of my life, all my accomplishments, all my achievements, everything I've done, all my failures. God, here it is. And even just going back to just surrendering your emotions. God, all my hurt, all my pain, the emotional trauma, the wounds that I have that are open inside of me. God, I ask that you just come and you just heal them and bandage them and our identity. God, here I am. How I see, my, see myself. Lord, I just surrender it to you. Thank you, God. Let's bow our heads. Lord God, we just thank you, God, for this time. Lord, I know that you're asking us for a deeper level of surrender. Even starting today, God, we, we surrender all that we are to you. We love you, Lord, and we need you, God. We need your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, even now, just come and just touch those, those people that are, that are hurt inside. You go in the inner depths of our hearts. Touch every area of our life, God. We want to be surrendered in every area of our life. We crucify our flesh, our self, today, God. We are crucified with you, Jesus. It is not us living today, but you, Jesus, living through us. And we just thank you, Jesus, that you are the ultimate example of surrender. When you gave your life willingly on the cross for us, while we were yet sinners, you died, not knowing if we would give our life to you, God, but you still died for us. And in turn, God, we give our life back to you. We thank you, Jesus. Is there anybody in this place that you've never accepted Christ? You've never given your alabaster jar of, of your life to God, and you want to do that today. Can you, just, can you just lift your hand if that is you? Or maybe you've, you've, you need to rededicate your life. Remember, living for God is all about making that everyday choice. That is you. Just lift your hand. Man, I see your hands. Anybody else? Amen. Let's just repeat this prayer. Say, Lord God, thank you for dying on the cross. I ask you right now that you come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. I give my life. I give my will to you. And I receive your Holy Spirit, right now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's just all stand. Can we all right now, just even right now, just lift our hands as a sign of surrender? And just say, God, I surrender to you. All that I am, I surrender to you. All that I've been, I surrender to you. My future, I surrender to you. We just thank you, God. 
We just thank you for your presence in this place. Just touch every heart in this place. Touch every life in this place. Touch every hurt in this place, Holy Spirit. We love you, God, and we just, we worship you. Even now, I feel the Holy Spirit saying this now, church, if there's anybody that, you're, you, that, that, that you can remember that has hurt you, I, I just right now, if you're led by the Holy Spirit, just say, I forgive them. I forgive them. I believe even now that God's going to begin to heal hearts and heal lives. Yes, God. Just thank you, Jesus. I want to continue to surrender to you, Jesus. Whatever it takes, God, to make us the people that you called us to be. Continue to build our faith. We may be used by you. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. And everybody says...